Well, bless the name of the Lord. I hope and pray that you are ready for the Word of God. This is the first sermon of 2022, um, and I am godly excited. You already know what's coming. We are in Fight for the Family F3, um, and it is a theme that we have had before, but I just believe that, uh, you know, what we're coming through uh, in 2020, 2021, entering into 2022, we really need to focus on our families and fight for our families. Um, and so all year long, we're going to be having um, the Fs that are out in front of us that are going to help us as a church family, as you already heard, to focus um, and to fight for our family. So I am super excited about um, this word. And God laying it in my heart. I, I, I believe um, that if you pay attention today and give me your attention, um, that we'll be able to encourage you, um, inspire you by the word of God, and hopefully um, move you to action. Uh, because I believe that the word of God, um, it, it speaks of itself, right? That the word of God is sharp uh, and it's sharper than any two-edged two sword, right? So this word, I believe, is going to cut in some areas, but it will also heal in some areas as we begin to fight for our families. Ride with me. Hopefully you got your book. No, I guess you wouldn't have your books yet. But when you have your books, um, you know, you'll be able to take notes right in there. There's a downloadable version too that you'll be able to get access to on the website. So, so make sure you're riding with us. This is Fight for the Family. Um, and you know, the whole month of January, um, our first F is faith. Um, but today we're going to just kind of set the foundation uh, for the whole year uh, with the fight for the family message. So uh, we're going to begin in Nehemiah chapter 4. I've already prayed and sought the Lord. So Nehemiah responds, he, he, he uh, states this. So I stationed our men behind the wall in the lowest places, the places that were most exposed, at the positions where it was least protected. And I stationed the people in the in families with their swords, spears, and bows. That's a whole message in and of itself. When I saw their fear, I stood and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. That was the enemy that was coming after them. Confidently remember the Lord who is great and awesome and with courage from him, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, listen, and for your homes. That encapsulates the whole um, idea of what we're talking about. So this uh, message today will not be a, a necessarily a contextual message. It will be a topical message. And the topic is fight for the family. Um, you know, I believe that uh, we have come through a tumultuous uh, year, a year and a half, year and nine months, um, and that we are um, at a precipice, and that precipice is that we're entering into a new year, but unless we change our mindsets, listen, it will just be another month in the year. In other words, 12, 31, 21 does not symbolize anything specific, specifically if you bring your old way of thinking into the new year. And so we're being intentional this year about um, giving you a plan and walking with you um, through this year to be able to do what? Fight for the family. We've got merchandise. We've got books we're going to give you. There's going to be seminars throughout the year so we can do what? Fight for the family. Now, many of you know the story of Nehemiah. Um, so I'll give you a bit of a backdrop, but I don't want to spend too much time there. You really want to research it and read it for yourself. I promise you it's a story that will encourage you and help you to understand the power, listen, the power of leadership, the power of God, the power of unity, um, and the power of community coming together to restore a broken place. Well, Nehemiah, um, you know, was, was the cupbearer to the king because the nation was captured um, by another nation, and Nehemiah had risen to the highest level um, within the government as it relates to being a cupbearer for the king. Um, and God had opened this door for him, so essentially Nehemiah was doing pretty well for himself. He was living in the suburbs, had a nice house, big car, if you will, and of course I'm just using um, analogies here, um, and, and he was doing well. Uh, but, but while he was doing his job um, in the nation that he was in, um, he asked a question. And he asked a question about his brethren who were back in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem had been ravaged, it had been torn down, the walls had been uh, torn down, and some people escaped to get back to Jerusalem. 
So Jeremiah asked a question. Uh, I, I mean, Nehemiah asked a question in Nehemiah um, chapter 1. Um, he asked this question, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 2. It says that Hananiah, one of my brothers and some men from Judah came, and I asked them about the surviving Jews who had escaped and survived captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who have survived the captivity are in, listen, great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its fortified gates have been burned and destroyed by fire. And so now it uh, came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying constantly before the God of heaven. Here's what I believe. I believe that if we're going to, listen, if we're going um, to fight for our families, if we're going to restore broken things, if we're going to repair families that are broken up and separated and divided, we have to do like Nehemiah. We have to, watch this, inquire about the condition of our families. We have to be intentional about inquiring about the condition of our families. You know, so often, so often there is uh, much dysfunction within our families. There, there are family secrets that we don't talk about. There are issues that happen within families, and so often we've learned to live with that dysfunction. In other words, it becomes normative. In other words, dysfunction becomes the normal functioning within our families. There's a term that is used in psychology called epigenetic trauma. And many a times um, trauma happens in families and then we pass that trauma down from one generation to the next. It goes unaddressed. So it affects our behaviors. It affects our view of self, our view of God, and our view of our family. We've all got those family things that happen, you know, and you know what we say, what happens in this house stays in this house. Well, many a times people are being reintroduced to trauma over and over again. Again, um, you know, while they are living in that home. But, but Nehemiah did something, even though he was doing well for himself, he was concerned about his brother man. He was concerned about his sister. He was concerned about the nation of Jerusalem. Essentially, he was concerned about the family of God. This spoke to my heart as I was reading it and as I was, and, and as I was um, thinking about it, right? I thought about, man, what did Nehemiah have to do to really understand the plight of the children of Israel and what was going on back in Jerusalem? The first thing he had to do was inquire. He had to be concerned enough to ask somebody who knew what's going on with my people. What's going on in my family? What's going on with those who have escaped captivity and are back in Jerusalem? How are they doing? How are they faring? Right? And so we have to really ask questions right, about our family and ask questions about what's going on in our family unit. So many of us, so many people are not talking to family members. They're not talking to their mothers and their fathers. Their parents are not talking to their children. And so uh, children are being lost. I'm going to share with you some statistics later. But the reality is he inquired about them. Watch this. And then he didn't stop there. Because a lot of times we inquire, but we don't listen. And one thing that, that, that Nehemiah did is he listened to the plight and to the situation that was going on in Jerusalem. He, was, he, he paid attention. He gave thoughtful attention to the problem. So often, we don't really want to hear what's going on. We don't really want to know what's going on because if we know what's going on, then we have some responsibility. When is the last time you sat down and asked, how are things in the family? but then not got defensive about it when, it when you didn't hear what you wanted to hear. So often what we do is we shut people down when they start telling us the truth. We have to be able to handle the truth, but you're not going to get the truth until you create an environment, listen, of listening, giving thoughtful attention to the problem. Nehemiah literally sat down and he listened. He heard after he inquired, he listened to what was going on. He listened to the pain. He listened to the fact that, what does it say? It said that they are in great affliction and they are in reproach right now and the walls are broken down and the gates thereof are burned with. Now listen, they're in affliction and anybody who is in affliction is grieving. They're suffering. They're going through. 
They're under great reproach, which means they're under attack, right? And so now you've got a nation of people, a family of people, come on, who have already been captured and taken into a foreign land. Some escape, some get back to captivity. And when they get there, they're grieving, they're in affliction, they're under reproach. Some of you right now are like that, sitting in the house, listening to me preach today, right? You're grieving, you're under great affliction, you've got great reproach. Some of our families are under those same things. Listen, and it said the walls are broken down. Walls are given for protection. In that time, there was war that happened all the time, and the walls would protect enemies from coming in. So when the walls were broken down, it opened the door for enemies to come in and to attack and take what you have worked for. And so for many of us and for many people, the walls of protection are broken down in the home. Right? And he says the walls of Jerusalem are broken down uh, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Gates represent authority and access. And so we see here that they're saying that the gates where people come in and out of, they're burned down so anybody can come in. They don't have to climb over the broken wall. They just have access and authority to come in and out of your life, come in and out of your home. The enemy is coming in and out and causing and wreaking havoc in your household. And what I'm encouraging us to do as a church is to fight for our families. Is to, is to build up the broken down walls, is to repair the broken gates, right? To take back our authority and to control what comes in and out of our household. Yeah, you, you understand, watch this, that when he listened, he listened without judgment. I've always said that listening is not, is not judging what somebody says, it's being willing to take the journey with them, to allow them to talk to the finish, to allow them to share their hearts. Listening is caring. Because when you feel listened to, you feel cared for. I can't tell you how many times, I'm just going to be honest, Christina has said, you're not listening to me. I'm like, yes, I'm listening. She's like, no, you're not listening. You're on your phone. You're you're distracted. You're doing all other kinds of things. You're not listening to me. When you're listening to someone, it means you're giving them thoughtful attention, that you are paying attention, eye-to-eye contact, you know, proper body language, not, not with folded arms, but you're listening because when you set yourself to listen, listen, the scripture tells us in James that we should be slow to speak and quick to listen and slow to anger. And, and so Nehemiah listened without judgment, listen, and then he had what? Compassion on them. He had this great compassion for his people who uh, were, were, were in great affliction and great reproach and they're broken down and they're living in difficult places, right? And they're under attack and they're not doing well. He had enough concern for them to listen, listen to what they are saying. Without judgment, he had compassion on them. And then the Bible says, the Bible goes on to say that he wept and he mourned. I'm still right in, right in that passage of Scripture, verse 4, right? He wept and he mourned, and he didn't just cry a tear. He wept. There's one thing to cry, but when you're weeping, you are feeling the pain of someone else. How about the reality, come on, that there are people in your household and people in your family who are suffering in great affliction and reproach, and you, the body of Christ, are called to rise up and go be a blessing and go to heal some stuff that has been messed up for years or maybe has just gotten out of hand. It says he wept. The Bible says that when, 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 when Lazarus died, um, that Jesus wept. I believe he was weeping for the unbelief of the people, but I believe he was also weeping for his friend, even though he knew he was not dead, he was just asleep. But the idea is that our Lord could weep. Come on, we can weep too, right? And we have to weep for the plight of our brother, for the plight of our sister. Listen, for the plight of our families, I just, I just, I won't say I lost a niece. My niece went home to be with the Lord. And when I tell you I cried, I wept, I wept when she, when we found out that she passed away, I cried till I didn't have any more tears left. I I just, I couldn't even cry anymore. Why? Because I was hurting on the inside for the loss that she's not going to be here on this earth, but we know that she's in glory, but it pained me so deeply. When is the last time you wept for your family that is alive? Because there are people in your household who are hurting people who are going through. He wept and he mourned. But he didn't stop there. According to the text of Scripture, watch this, he fasted and he prayed. 
Now, this is powerful because he didn't just fast, uh, you know, just, just he fasted for, for the people of God. He needed direction. He needed an answer. And isn't it perfect that we are getting ready to enter in to our corporate fast? to our time of praying and seeking the face of God, to our time of entreating the Lord. Why not pray for your family? Why not pray intensely for broken relationships? Because remember, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And in some of our families, watch this, the wall of protection, because your home should be your safest place, your family should be your safest place, there are some broken down walls in our families. Right, And so we see here that he fasted and he prayed. Now I want to take you over to Isaiah chapter 58 um, and verse 6, 7, and 8. And it's going, to, it's going to talk about the fast that the Lord desires. So as we're going on this fast, let us not be so concerned about ourselves. Well, as we're going on this fast, let us be concerned about what the word of God, because Isaiah 58 tells us the kind of fast that God is looking for. He said, rather, is this not the fast which I choose to undo bonds of wickedness? Some of the stuff that has happened in our family is wicked. We've allowed the enemy to run roughshod in our houses, to tear the pieces of ropes of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break apart every enslaving yoke. You know that when your family is broken down, it is a yoke of bondage that God wants us to fight for our families in fasting and prayer. Watch this, in weeping and mourning. Rather, is this not the fast which I chose to undo the bonds of wickedness? Go on. Watch this. It's going to say, it is not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked that you cover him and not to hide yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood. Hold up right there. Go back. Look at what it says. And not to hide yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood. God is literally asking us a question. That when we are fasting and when we are pursuing God, when we are looking for God's grace and when we're looking for God's power and the anointing during the fasting and prayer, oh God, we want to hear your voice. God, we want to see your face. God, we want breakthrough. And God is saying, what about your family? He said, and not to hide yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood. In other words, what God is saying, come on, is that some people are fasting and they're denying the people in their own household or their own flesh and blood. He wouldn't have put it in there if that wasn't the case. So God is lifting this up and saying, as we fast and as we pray, let us be sure that we're tending to the needs of our own flesh and blood, our own children, our own wives, cousins, aunties, and uncles. God's saying, y'all need to come together and y'all need to work out that stuff that has been keeping you set up, uh, 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 separated. Look at what it says. He says in verse 8, he says, then your light will break like the dawn, break out like the dawn. Some of y'all don't need a breakthrough. You need a breakout, a breakout of the light and glory of God. You need a breakout. And if you want a breakout, do what the word says. Divide your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless into your house. If you see somebody naked, bless them. But don't hide yourself from your own family. Don't allow the devil to cause your family to be separated and divided. Look at what it says. Then your light will break out like the dawn and your healing. In other words, some of our sickness is directly connected, come on, to us not hearing and adhering to the word of God. God help me. Will you quickly spring forth? Your righteousness will go before you, leading you to peace and prosperity. Listen, and the glory of the Lord, God help me, the glory of the Lord will will be your rear guard. God says, listen, like Nehemiah fasted and prayed, come on, he got before the Lord. Isaiah reminds us that the fast that God is looking for is not something that's about you. It's about being a blessing. It's about being used of God. It's about healing your family. It's about serving those who are less fortunate. In January and the rest of the year, be intentional, come on, about restoring broken places because it goes on to say, then you will be called called a repairer of the breach. In so many of our families, there are breaches, right? There are spaces that are broken down. There are, there, there are gaps in the wall. And God is saying it's time to heal them. Why not? Listen, why not pray and fast and believe God 
to bring your family together under the guise of the Spirit of the Lord and under the guise of the grace of God. Because listen, some of their sickness and some of our sickness is directly connected to broken relationships within our family. God help me. All right. So we see here that Nehemiah, after, after he, you know, after he prayed and after he mourned, uh, you read it in, in, in chapter 2, he went before the king, uh, and the king hooked him up, right? And the, the, the king gave him letters, 1 and 2, uh, the, the king gave him letters of authority. He left where he was, went down to Jerusalem. God hooked him up with all that he needed to be able to get there, and he arrives, and look at what he does. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 13. So I went out at night by the valley gate towards the dragon's well and the refuse gate and inspected the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were consumed by fire. The, the thing that Nehemiah did that blessed me is he went to where the problem was, right? And he assessed the damage. If you read all through chapter two, he took a, he took a 360 degree um, assessment of what was going on. He went to every gate, every place that it was broken down to assess the problem. When is the last time you assessed your family? See, a lot of times what we want to do is we want to see the manifestation and we're like, you know what, later for them, I'm cutting them off. I can't deal with them. That's your family, baby. God birthed you into that family. And so you can't just, you can't just keep them at an arm's length. God's saying, I want to heal that. I want to restore that. But before you can restore it, you got to assess the damage. You got to assess what's going on in your marriage. You got to assess what's going on with your children. You got to assess what's going on with your extended family, your in-laws and, and, and your cousins and aunties and them. And you got to be intentional about, listen, and here's the thing. God ain't asking you to be them. God's asking you to be a person of God, a child of the king. God's asking you to go and break down that barrier. Listen, you can't control what they do, but you can control what you do. He said, when you do these things, then your righteousness is going to shine forward like the light in the dawn. In other words, that, that there'll be a breaking forth and a breaking out for you when you obey the word of God. Maybe you need to write a, write a letter, send an email, do a Facebook post, reach out to your family, try to heal those broken places. This is going to challenge some of y'all. I know you ain't going to like me. You're probably throwing stuff at the TV right now. Shut up, pastor. Well, I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to continue to preach this word. Why? Because we've got to get together and we've got to bring healing. We've got to repair those broken places and those breaches that have that have happened. Let's talk about America. Let me, let me share some stuff with you about America. Let's talk about America. Listen, divorce. Despite the fact that the rate of marriages is declining faster than the rate of divorce, experts predict that somewhere between 40 and 50% of all marriages existing today will ultimately end in divorce. Watch this. Baby boomers age 60 and up are divorcing at a much higher rate than any other group. The ones who are divorcing the most are the ones who've been married the longest. This is crazy. And so something is wrong. That means that, you know, and I was, I was watching Bishop Jakes uh, the, the other day and he was talking about, you know, the family and so forth and so on. He said he hates, he hates counseling couples. Now, I don't, I don't have that. I love counseling couples, me and my wife. Um, but, but, but he was like, because they wait till the last minute. And let me just give a disclaimer. This is not about anybody personally. I, you know that this was Bishop Jakes. He, he just said it. Go look at it. Fight for the family. Uh, Bishop Jakes. Uh, he was like, man, they wait till the last minute to come to me. And then when, it, you know, right before they're going to the court, then they come to the bishop and come to the pastor. Look at, for, look at it for yourself and see what he said. This is not about anything that I'm doing. I, I still love counseling couples. I still, working with, I still love working with couples. But watch this. The baby boomers are getting divorced. That means that the, the house has been on fire for a long time. And they just allowed the house to burn for so long that the whole house is going to burn down. You got to get it, right? Divorce is, is, is it's in the church just like it's in the world. But we have the word of God. We have the teaching of Christ. We have the love of Jesus. We have all of that. Watch this. And the word of God is the basic instructions before leaving the earth. If you want to know how to be in a healthy marriage, check the word of God. It speaks to you. Husbands, love your wives, Ephesians 5, as Christ has loved the church. In Ephesians 5, it says that we should submit one to another. In other words, there is uh, instruction in the word of God on how to have a happy marriage. 
Addiction in 2020. More people died of overdoses in the United States last year than in any other year, a one-year period in our history. More than 93,000 people died. The increase from the previous year was also more than we've ever seen, up 30%. So 2019, up 30%, up 2020, up even more percentage. 93,000 people died of an overdose. They died of taking something to anesthetize their pain. Watch this. And many of them are in our households, in our communities. And so we got to be mindful. And in our family, we got to be mindful that we have to listen to people. We have to talk and we have to spend time trying to understand and have empathy for our family members who are strung out on drugs or who are just trying to deal with their pain. Mental health, an estimated 26% of Americans age 18 and older that have reported about one in four suffers from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. Many people suffer from more than one mental disorder at a given time. In particular, depressive illnesses tend to co-occur with substance abuse and anxiety disorders. In other words, what am I saying? I just talked about addiction and I talked about mental health many a times people who are struggling with addiction are have mental health issues at a very high percentage those who are incarcerated many a time have mental health issues that's why we're opening our LTSR to be able to get people out of prison and get them into a, a forensic community that can provide them with the support that they need what am I saying to you mental health one in four and that's the people that report just imagine all of the people who never sit down with a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a counselor. Many of them are in our homes. Many of them are in our families. Many of them are in our church. Y'all know I believe in therapy. I'm like, find yourself a good therapist, Christian therapist, or not. Find somebody you can talk to so you can get the help that you need. I'm a proponent of that. Someday you'll be able to come to me when I don't work here at the church and, you know, we'll be able to do something on the side. But the point being is that we need to be talking. And then in the minority community, there is a, a high propensity for people not to seek therapy. So now, not only are we dealing with addiction, now we're not dealing with, now we got mental health issues, but now we got issues that are even larger because we're not addressing it. Epigenetic trauma, generational trauma that is passed down has an impact on how you live your life how you build your life, the relationships that you build. I'm still talking about fighting for the family. Suicide. Suicide rates increased 33% in 10 years from 1999 to 2019. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. It was responsible for more than 47,000 deaths in 2019. This is pre-pandemic which is about a, a death every 11 minutes. One death every 11 minutes. The, the number of people who think about or attempt suicide is even higher. And in 2019, 12 million American adults seriously thought about suicide. 3.5 planned a suicide attempt and 1.4 million attempted suicide. These are the ones who attempted and didn't succeed. So you add that in to the, uh, you know, to the other, uh, you know, numbers. And what you have is you have a plethora of individuals who are suffering so deeply, a lot with mental illness, a lot with addiction, who lose hope. They're hopeless. They, they, they come to a place where they're thinking I shouldn't live anymore. This is happening in our families, people. And so why am I saying fight for the family? The statistics speak for themselves. And if we're not fighting for the family, what are we doing? Suicide affects all ages. It's the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 34. The fourth leading cause among people ages 35 to 44 and the fifth leading cause of people um, ages 45 to 54. In other words, it's in the top 10 in all of those categories. And there's a growing population of young children who are killing themselves. Listen, did you hear what I said? Age 10 to 34. It's the second leading cause, which means a 10-year-old and some younger are taking their lives because they have lost hope. They're being bullied. We've got to fight for our families, and we've got to make sure that we are checking in and having empathy and listening to our children and listening to our spouses. Watch this. Poverty. We find that child poverty increased by an average of 1.8%. From 15% in 2019 to 17.5% in 2020. Based on families reports in 20 and 21, this translates to roughly, listen, 12.5 million children living in poverty or 1.2 um, 
million more than 2019. A million children when we crossed from 2019 to 2020, uh, 1.2 million entered into the poverty line. This is devastating. And so when children are involved in poverty, they're less likely to do well in school. They're more likely to have uh, mental issues. They're more likely to get involved in the criminal justice system. They're more likely, right, to end up in juvenile justice. When poverty exists, come on, it only creates um, an opportunity for children not to have what they need. And then many a times they find alternative ways to get it. See, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be real simple here. We've got to fight for our families, fight for our children, and that means we need to fix our finances too. We'll get to that. Listen to this last one. This is my last, this is my last statistic. Man, I can't believe it's already this time. The Pew Research reports today that the number of self-identified Christians has declined by 12% since 2012 while religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, have grown by 10 points during that time. In 2020, 47% of U.S. adults belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque, down more than 20 points from the turn of the century, changed primarily due to a rise in Americans with no religious preference. What are we seeing? We're seeing that people are leaving the faith, people are leaving God, people are choosing to walk away from the church, but at the same time, divorce is up, suicide is up, mental health is up, addictions is up, right? And so divorce is up, and all of this is happening, and the church, listen, um, is is silent, and we're not uh, making enough uh, impact in our communities. Watch this. But it begins in our families. I'm giving you all these statistics to help you understand Nehemiah now shows up and Nehemiah gets to the place and they begin to do what? They begin to rebuild. They begin to take a look at what's going on after he assesses the problem. And and, and you know what? You've got to be willing to be honest about the problem. You've got to tell the truth. How do I assess my family? I've got to be honest with myself. I've got to ask hard questions. I've got to ask hard questions. I've got to share difficult stories. I've got to be honest with my family about my hidden issues and be able to listen to their hidden issues. You see, we'll never assess appropriately until we create an environment where we can communicate, where we can talk, where we can fight for our family. I don't know what I'm fighting for. I just told somebody the other day, if I don't know, how can I fight for you? If I'm not aware of what you're going through, how can I help? How can I assist you? if you're holding on to that information and not sharing it. I'm not a mind reader. And so the reality is we have to be sure that we are talking and listening and spending time, quality time together. Uh, The next point is, watch this, they begin to rebuild. Nehemiah chapter 3, it says, Then Elishayev, the high priest, rose up with his brothers and priests and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set it up its doors, and they consecrated the wall westward to the tower um, of the hundred and as far as the tower of Hananiah. In other words, watch this, they begin to work. Nehemiah addresses them. He inspires them. He assesses everything. They get inspired and they're like, we're going to pick up where we left off because they tried to do this uh, under another leader. But now we're going we're gonna to pick up and we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to start working on this family. We're going to start working on this wall. We're going to start working on Jerusalem. You see, here's the reality. We have to rebuild the foundations of faith. It's amazing. I was talking to another pastor a while back and he said, uh, she said, isn't it amazing that when they started to rebuild, the first thing they rebuilt was the sheep gate. And it was the priests who got out front. This is a very powerful um, insight that, in other words, that if we're going to rebuild, the first thing we need to rebuild is the sheep gate. We need to make sure that the sheep are finding their way to Jesus in our families, in our extended families, right? We need to make sure that Christ is at the center of our household, which means Bible study. It means family prayer. It means laying hands on one another. It means talking about the word around the dinner table. It means being ensure that your children children and your family knows that at our family, Christ is the center. Joshua said it in Joshua 24, verse 15. He said, as for me and my house, if you live in here, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, when you get grown, you can go do what you want to do. But while you're here, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to honor God. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10, verse 7. So Jesus said again, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I am the door for the sheep leading to life. 
All who came before me as false messiahs and self-appointed leaders are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not hear them. Listen, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture, which is spiritual security. In other words, what, look, they rebuilt the sheep gate. They made sure, come on, that sacrifices could be offered. That this, And it was on the east side, right? And the east is symbolic of entrance into the tabernacle, into the presence of God, that we've got to make sure in our families that, listen, God is at the center of all we do, that we surround ourselves, come on, and we put ourselves in a place where God can be glorified. The next thing I noticed as I was reading through here, watch this, is that progress will be met with opposition. Y'all be patient with me. Uh, uh, Progress will be met with opposition. You do know, you do know, in Nehemiah chapter 4 it says this, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a heart to work. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Amorites, and the Ashadites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches were being closed, they were very angry. In other words, watch this, as you are rebuilding your family, there's going to be some folk in your family who don't think you have any business doing this. And you've got to have the courage to say, I'm not doing this in my name. I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. I'm trying to apologize to you because God instructed me by his word that I need to fix this. I need to make this relationship right. And you don't have to worry about what they do. All you've got to do is obey God. They were met with resistance, Sanballat and Tobiah. Come on, they plotted against the nation and Nehemiah and said, listen, first they tried to make fun of them. They were like, if they build this wall, uh, all, we, all a fox has to do is come in and the whole wall is going to fall down. Listen, people are going to talk about you. People are going to run you down. People are going to say, you ain't got no business doing this. I'm encouraging you not to listen to their voices. I'm encouraging you to press in for your family. I'm encouraging you to restore broken places. He said, when the breaches were being repaired in the family, there are breaches in relationship. And what God is saying is, get back in there. Come on, rebuild it. Come on. It says, when the wall was built to have his height come on then the enemy started coming because he didn't think anything was going to happen the enemy will always doubt you come on when you're doing the will of God but what I'm telling you today is you've got to get your heart and your mind set on Jesus and not let the voices of people stop you from doing what God has called you to do it said verse 7 uh, when they heard that the repair of the walls went on and that the breaches were being closed, they got mad. You need to know this. The enemy is going to come against you. He's going to come against you in the form of everything he can. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna lie on you. He's going to talk about you. He's going to say you have wrong motives. I'm telling you, silence the voice of the devil and listen to the voice of God. Don't deny your own flesh and blood as you pursue your family, as you pursue to heal your family, as you pursue to strengthen your family. Let God be exalted. Let God be true and every man be a liar. Are y'all with me today? Listen. And as I come to a close, my last point is this. We must wage warfare for our families. Man. Uh, Nehemiah said this. The people got afraid and the people got weary because they told a a lie that these armies were going to come against the nation of Israel. And that they were going to ransack the walls and, you know, armies were going to come from all different directions. And that people had gotten together and they were going to overthrow the nation. And, and, and Nehemiah, being a man of God, discerned what was going on, and he had already heard what their plan was. Look at what he says. He says, when I saw their fear, I stood and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Here's what he says. Confidently remember the Lord who is great and awesome and with courage from him. Here's the key. God wants your family to be healed. God wants your family to be restored. The enemy will do everything he can to keep you separated and divided. I know I don't have all the answers. I really don't. But I know this is what God placed upon my heart. And I tried to do something else. I, I tried. I talked to people. I, I got feedback. And I, I tried to do something else. But I am, I am 100% sure if I, if I be a man of God, if you trust me as your pastor, 
trust that this is the word of the Lord. Your family is going to go through some very difficult things. And the thing you cannot do is fight one another. The thing you cannot do is project your anger onto your brothers and your sisters and your mother and your father. The thing you cannot do is allow the enemy, come on, to cause you guys to continue to be divided. The thing you cannot do, come on, is give the enemy a foothold, right, for you to walk in anger and to walk in hatred and to, and, and to walk in, 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 in bitterness towards your family members. Because when you do that, come on, you're misappropriating the grace of God that God has given you. God wants your light to shine. Listen, God saved you in your family so you can be a light. You may not even understand why God saved you. Maybe you're, the, maybe you're the only one in your family who knows Jesus. Well, guess what? You're supposed to be a light to everyone else. Man, families have gone through so much. My, my family went through a lot in 2021. But God, who is rich in mercy, stayed with us. And, and, and look what he says. Confidently remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And with courage from him, fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. And watch this. Fight for your household, for your home. God has blessed you. God has blessed me. No family is perfect. Can I tell you that? No family is perfect. Every family has issues. You know, that's one of my favorite passages in the scripture. Every family has issues. But the reality is, is that if you're in that family, God has called you to be a light, to heal broken places, to restore breaches, to repair broken relationships, to encourage those who have lost their way, to go after. See, because there's some folk, listen, there's some folk, and I hope y'all can, I can connect with this. Your, your, your children or your grandchildren are so far out there, you think, man, they'll never come back. But I'm telling you, it's the season to fight. It's the season to do warfare. Now, let me give you, let me give you scripture on that. Right? Because Ephesians 6 and 12 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The attack on your family, come on, is not from your family. The attack on your family is from the enemy. It is spiritual wickedness, right? We're not contending with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, this present darkness, this present darkness, that the darkness is real and it is impacting our children, our children's children, it is impacting our marriages, that the enemy is strategic strategic and how he comes to bring division and schism within your family just like he was trying to discourage Nehemiah he's trying to discourage you and and I know I know that you may be thinking you don't know what they've done pastor you don't know how badly they've hurt me you don't know how deeply come on I've been wounded Uh, listen I've been wounded too I've been hurt too but listen I'm not the only one look at Jesus Look at how badly they, they, they left him. He was a man of sorrows and he was despised and rejected and he came to love us. We have not shed blood. In other words, God says that I am desirous of you by the power of God and by the spirit of God to fix those relationships to focus and fight for your family to do warfare in fasting and prayer see because some things are not going to be fixed some generational curses are not going to be broken until you fast and pray and seek the face of God and press in watch this lay your pride to the side go knock on the door make a phone call send a text whatever you need to do to begin the dialogue of healing and restoring watch this God is encouraging you to do this by the word of God. And he says, you got to remember that says that, that, that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but all of these principalities and powers are fighting against you and your family uh, of this present darkness and against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly, watch this, supernatural places. As long as the devil can keep us fighting against one another, we will never, ever be able, watch this, to understand and appropriate the power of God to put him in his proper place. It says, therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger, having done everything that the crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared. Listen, stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, and victorious. This is, this is the word of God for this house. Now, some of you, some of you will grasp it, and some of you will throw it to the side. The word, the Bible says that people missed the promise of God because they did not add faith to it. They missed the rest of God. And I'm telling you that if you add faith to this word 
and you walk with us over this, over this year, broken places can be restored. Relationships can be fixed. God can be glorified. Somebody, your child is out there, and you haven't spoken to your child. And you worry about them, and you pray for them, but you've given up. You've washed your hands. I'm telling you, God is saying, go back and get that child. Just like God came for you, Christ Jesus came for you, go get that child. Somebody, your relationship with your mother or your father is broken. God is saying, heal that relationship. Do your best to restore it. Fix the breach. Some of you, brothers and sisters, sibling rivalries are real. Resolve it. Fix it. Forgive. You know, my, my niece, God bless her soul, was intentional before she passed away. God did this for her of fixing things that were broken, talking to people that she was, had a broken relationship with. And, and it was beautiful because God did that for her. God did that for her. And here's the thing. The Bible says it's appointed to man to die one time and then the judgment. So the question becomes, if you were to die today, are those relationships healed? While there is breath, there is hope. This year we're fighting for the family. I hope you will join us and you will ride with us next week. We're talking about faith, baby. We're, we're going to talk about the faith, the glue that holds it all together, the faith that lifts us up, the faith that overcomes this world, the faith that gives us the ability to walk um, and believe God when we can't see. So all the rest of the month we're talking about faith. This was foundational for me to encourage you. I feel so much better. I've delivered the word the Lord has laid on my heart to deliver to you. At the beginning of the year, we're fasting and we're praying. At the beginning of the year, we're consecrating ourselves. Isaiah 58 says, listen, if you want to be healed, if you want your light to break forth, don't hide yourself from your family. Come out of hiding. God says, I want to heal, fix, and restore what the enemy thought that he destroyed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of our God. Listen, I love you all. Uh, may the grace of God be with you, keep you, and cover you. Listen, um, I want to do two things real quick. Um, first, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for your family. I want to pray that God give you the wisdom and the strategy um, and the courage and the boldness to go into those places, have those necessary conversations. Husbands and wives, I'm going to pray that God give you the grace to talk to one another and speak the truth in love. Let me say it, speak the truth in love, children to your parents, to be able to ensure that there is health in the family. This is the first step. We bless God for you. Lord, I thank you for these families that took time to watch us on YouTube, on Facebook, as we fight for the family this year. We've read the statistics, and there's so many more statistics out there that are proving to us that the family is under attack. We ask God that you would be with us, that you would give us the grace, strength to do what you've called us to do. For this, we give you praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. And then last but not least, you might be out there and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. I will tell you, there's no greater family to be in than the family of God. And you heard me read out of uh, John chapter 10 where it said Jesus is the sheep gate. You, if you're going to come to God, you got to come through him. But if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Open your heart up to Jesus. Open your heart up to become a child of God. Open your heart up to be born again, filled with the Spirit of God. Open your heart up to him. And I, I know that many a times we think we have to be perfect to come to Jesus. No, come as you are, broken, hurting, frustrated, angry, addicted, rejected, abused. He loves you. And he wants to heal you. He wants to give you a new life and bring you into the family of God. If that's you today, I want to pray a simple prayer with you. Pray with me. Lord, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I made some mistakes, Lord. I've done some things wrong. I was born a sinner and it just got worse over time. But Lord, I'm coming to you now. Jesus, I want you to come into my heart, come into my life. I give you my life. I make a commitment to you. Forgive me of my sins. 
everything that I've done that was ever wrong and not right in your sight. I'm sorry, Lord. I ask that you would forgive me. Give me a fresh start. I want to love you and I want to walk with you for the rest of my days. Fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. Teach me how to live a life that honors you. And I will give you praise. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins and I believe that he rose again from the dead. And therefore, I am saved. I'm rescued in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. First and foremost, welcome to the kingdom of God. You are now a child of the king. Now we want you to put it in the chat. I'm saved today. I want you to just, just type it in there so somebody will know that you've accepted Jesus. There's ministers on the line who will reach out to you and just let you know how we can connect. Love to baptize you uh, when this COVID, um, you know, passes by. Um, we'll make sure to have a celebration of baptism for all of the people who come to know the Lord during this time. Listen, we love you. Grace and peace to you. We pray that you were blessed on this first Sunday of the new year. What are we doing? We're fighting for the family. F3, um, you can contact the church if you'd like to get a hoodie or a T-shirt. We just had to order a whole nother round um, and let it be a witnessing tool. Uh, we don't want you just to say it. We want you to wear it um, so you can talk to people about what your church is doing. We're fighting for the family. Well, listen, on all campuses at 1230, there will be a journal distribution. Now, listen, we spend a lot of money on these journals. We're giving them to you for free. So we're, we want you to use them. There's spaces in there for goals. There's spaces in there for, you know, all the stuff that you want, the sermon notes, the whole nine yards. This is for you, from your church to you. We're sowing into your life. 1230, all campuses, we're distributing these journals. God bless you. We'll see you out front of church. All right. God bless. Grace and peace.